Uh, David, thanks for being patient. Thanks very much. I'm going to try and give some reflections, not from a Red Cross movement, um, which is such a huge part of the, the, the system. I, I try to look at the report through the lens of national societies. So um, as a national society myself, working in the British Red Cross, but how our partner national societies, I'm aware many of us in this room operate through a model of partnership. And I tried to make sense of how partner organizations might make sense of um, some of these main findings. And just a, a point on that, I think sometimes we describe the old guard as, you know, in, in our case, Red Cross or Oxfam as these homogenous organizations. We're evolving dramatically as, as networks and networks of networks. And I think the, the, the future of federations and alliances and networks is something that requires a lot more understanding because how we operate now um, is very different from a few years ago. And I can see in the Red Cross, certainly, in 10 years' time, the network will function very differently from how it functions today. I just want to highlight um, three points that really I felt would chime with some of our national society partners who are very active in humanitarian response. The first, perhaps an obvious one, is the recognition of the growing importance and influence of national actors. Um, and that's something that was highlighted in, in, in the report. Um, and their potential. And I think a lot of the, the reports of the past, we focus very much on the international system. Um, and yet, so many of the, org the, op the operations, the humanitarian um, major operations we're involved in, or are indeed those that are really small and medium-sized <coughs> disasters. It is the role of national actors, and in our case, the role of the National Red Cross and Red Crescent, which is growing. Organizations that have potential, it is often latent potential, but there is a great growing assertiveness of those organizations. And we see that characterized by their desire to launch their own international appeals, to take an operational lead um, in, in major operations, a growing capacity, but a real resistance to perceived Western arrogance of national societies like the British Red Cross or the American Red Cross. And I think that is just a reflection of how many national organizations perceive the Western humanitarian agenda. And that's required very much the point that Jane says, far greater trust and building of, of understanding between us as northern partners in the Red Cross family with our southern partners. But I think that is common for many partners here. Um, I think I'm, we, we see a, a much stronger link between our national partners and host government structures and systems. And again, the need to really invest in those national structures, national response systems, I think is an, uh, an important point that the report ra raises. Uh, a voice that a, a comment I often hear from many Red Cross, Red Crescent leaders around as I travel to visit our operations is this reflection of the artificial division between humanitarianism and development. And that's a challenge for us, coming for any of us from a Dunantis tradition, um, but it re reflects the expanding remit of humanitarian action at national level. And many of these organizations, uh, and indeed I'm sure this will be the same for many others here working in partnership. Your partners investing more in preparedness, capacity building, DRR and resilience on the pre-emergency side, recovery, infrastructure rehabilitation, provision of basic health services, and so forth. So I think this exp the expanding remit of humanitarianism makes sense for many partners, but presents some of the fundamental challenges that the report raises and that indeed Mark just commented on. Is it humanitarianism or is it something else? Is it, isn't it just development? I mean, to do resilience and early warning and, you know, asset building and social protection. Yes, but maybe for many of them they would, they would be seen in their identity and their origins as humanitarian actors, but with a growing scope of activity and a growing remit. Okay. Um, and I, I think just some of the reflections that, that were perhaps not so strong in the report <coughs> is how poorly linked the national system is to the international system still. Um, and particularly at the different layers from the, the national to the regional to, to, to the global. And I think the old guard and the new guard are often awkward partners in how they coexist um, in operations. Um, and this chronic underinvestment of capacity building of local partners in organizational preparedness for response, um, there's increasingly a, de a demand and interest for technical support, um, a real interest in many of our partners in certification. Um, and I think that's something the report touches on briefly that would be interesting to pick up on. But leadership, the leadership agenda and interest there is not about leadership within the UN system, but leadership of national organizations. And there is such limited investment and resources to, to, to pay good quality, high caliber leaders to run national organizations. Many of those would rather work 
for highly paid international organisations. So there's a, a tension between improving the quality and professionalism without pushing out the national new or smaller actors. The second point is resilience. Um, and just briefly, uh, I think the rhetoric of resilience has, has really grown in prominence. We see that very strong in, in UK humanitarian policy in the HER report. Um, for us, interestingly, it's had, it seems to be having more traction than disaster risk reduction. It's pro provided a framework and approach for linking DRR, some climate change adaptation, food security and livelihoods, and indeed our health work in a, in a more helpful way. But we're still quite confused and at times blurred about what it means, and I do think we need greater clarity, because otherwise resilience risks becoming the catch-all for everything else. Um, finally, uh, this point that, that John concluded with on coherence, um, and that, that very telling quote at the, towards the end of the report that many organisations have willingly compromised the principles approach in their own conduct through close alignment with political and military activities and actors. And I, uh, my own reflection is I still think we have a very limited and poor understanding about what principles mean. We need to have a much greater understanding for, in our case, what it requires for the Syrian Arab Red Crescent today to navigate the most difficult lines of access to communities, being the only recognised organisation by the regime of whom there is a, a, a mechanism to deliver aid, but maintaining access and acceptance across borders requires compromise, requires putting staff and volunteers' lives at risk. That organisation, for, for example, has lost four of its staff since December, um, and yet is really challenged in its perceptions around neutrality and impartiality. And I see that similarly with the Somali Red Crescent over the last 20 years, has had to navigate very carefully and closely, but perhaps not in a classical, traditional, or highly visible way. And I think we need a much better understanding of how local organisations adapt to and work in a principled way. And uh, there's a recommendation at the end of the report for, um, to document good practice or achievements in collective principled approach in crisis contexts. I think that would be really interesting not to look at it from the point of view of international organisations, but national organisations who are there either as auxiliary of the state or part of a, a, a more enduring civil society. And then finally, one point that for me I was left with was a, a slight inherent contradiction that, that I was grappling with. But on one hand, the report refers to sh diminishing uh, access and space for humanitarian action, and yet we're seeing growing humanitarian action globally. Um, and of course this challenge around coverage, and yet as humanitarian action grows in remit, the, the coverage will always be insufficient. And I was left with the conclusion, will we not always conclude this report that humanitarian action falls short? That, that was very good.